Time is starting for you and me. Testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing. Bow, wow, wow. Yippee, yo, yippee. Teaching fading today. Good. All right. Good to go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's class. Today, what we will be learning about is fading off the prompt in obedience. So our objectives today are pretty simple, is what is fading off of the prompt? And what is the prerequisite? How to fading from the lower, whoops, typo. How to fade from the lower and fading from presentations. So what is fading off of the prompt? Fading off the prompt is simply a training process that results in the dog responding to the final desired cue from the handler. So in, in plain English, what that basically means is this is after we are able to get mark a behavior that we want the dog to do any way that we can, right? We went over that last, last lecture. It is the process where we can give whatever cue we want. Let's say it's something as simple because I'm going to be using um, the command down as an example in this lecture. Um, we can get the dog to go into a down, but say we have to bend over, we have to hold a treat to the ground, we have to point to the ground, we have to push on the dog's back, who knows? But we can get the dog to go down, but it's the process where we just simply want to use a single cue. So suppose it's just the word down, stand straight up. Doesn't matter if we're holding things in our hands, if we're sitting down, if we're standing up, if our back is turned to the dog, that if we say the word down, the dog understands what it is and does not need additional help for it to know that it's supposed to go into the command. So that's what we're going over today, basically here. And um, where it is on our checklist is, here's our checklist and um, we're right at the beginning of doing obedience over here in, in phase one. So the prerequisite is just be able to mark a behavior, which we went over last lecture. So if we want to fade off of a prompt, fade off of whatever help we're giving the dog to do the command, we just simply need to make sure we can get the dog to do that behavior any way we can, all right? The theme for a lot of the phase one stuff is to keep it simple, is training should ideally be a lot of mini easy lessons that you do. So don't try to accomplish too much when you make it easy and you and you set a lot of easy goals, you can actually move quicker, all right? You could do multiple mini lessons within a lesson. So after we mark a behavior, we can then work on work on on fading, all right? And because what we're doing here is we are building our our command structure, all right? So our command structure which we learn to build through this chart is how we're teaching our clients to communicate to our dog. Um, without getting too confused about this whole command structure over here. Whoops, I got to reload a page to use my little my little drawing board here. Hold on, give me one, give me one moment over here. Is um in order to use our our chart, let's refresh my page so let me use my thingy now. Okay, now it is. Is we're just really focusing on this part still. And I guess I guess this, all right? It's just this process right here in the beginning. Is we want to be able to give the dog a command. And if the dog obeys, we want to be able to praise the dog and, and give the dog a reward, right? It's just, it's just all of this stuff over here. That's what we're building in, in, phase, in phase one over here. All right. Now, how to fade a lure. The basics. So this is an easy, fading from the lure is a pretty easy concept, but I've learned that there's, there's really a bunch of little considerations if you want it to go really, really smooth. So first I'm going to give you the basics, but then I'm going to give you some important considerations is really 
two sets of considerations about luring. And if you understand this, um, any lesson about fading from the lure is, is super, super smooth. So before we go to any videos, the basics when we're going over luring is first, we always, once we are able to mark the behavior, when we're talking about obedience at this point, once I can just get the dog to show the behavior, right? I'm going to talk about down, but this could be heel, this could be sit, this could be going to a place, this could be come, right? Once, and this is usually quick, this is about, it's about mini lessons, mini lessons. Once you can get a dog to just go into that position, um, I'm going to start adding whatever cue. And the cue, most of the time, I would say 95% of the time I'm working with clients is going to be our voice. It's going to be a command. But the same concept holds true if you're working with like a deaf dog and you're using like a pager or a hand signal or you're using something or you're using something other than voice like a whistle or something like that, all right? If you understand dog training, which we're learning to do here, is it allows you to modify these instructions, take it apart, reconstruct it, reverse engineer, do whatever you do whatever you want with it. But um, once we get the dog to at least do the behavior, we start doing this process, all right? So what we want to do first over here is first, once we get the dog to do the behavior, we want to always give the desired cue. So I'm going to use the word down as, as an example, all right? We say the word down. Make sure you say, regardless of what you see in any past videos, old videos, the most efficient way to fade off the lure is to first, once the dog can do the command, give the cue first without any lure. Meaning, I'm just going to say down and I'm not going to do anything. Then, right after we would say the word down, then you would lure, right? You would lure the same way you learned in marking. So if it was doing down, I'm going to lure the dog into the position. There's distinct steps here, all right? If the dog does not lure into position, I will continue. I suggest you continue saying what your cue is going to be. So if we were doing down, if the dog was having trouble, I would continue saying the word down as I was as I was doing it, right? If I misjudged how much I wanted to lure, I would just keep saying down, down until the dog does it, all right? Once the dog does it, then you mark the behavior the same way you did in marking and then you reward, then you reward the behavior, you reward, you reward at that time. Now, the fading part is every time you repeat this process now, what you're going to do is it's very simple, is you're going to use less lure during the process. So we tell the dog down, and if we went all the way down to the ground the first time and we praise the dog and we did it, the next time we do it, we say down and we just don't go all the way to the ground to see if the dog will still go down. Now, the reason why I told you before that it's okay to repeat the cue is sometimes we lure too, we try to fade the lure too quickly. And instead of bending over, um, we didn't bend over enough to get the dog into the down and the dog is confused. You could just repeat the cue and just bend over a little more, bend over a little more. So what it would really look like, I'll show you some video, is um, I tell the dog down and I lure. If I, the dog didn't go all the way to the ground because I tried to fade it too much, just repeat the word down, go a little lower, down, a little lower, down, go a little lower. Remember the point where the dog um, responded to the lure, and then next time you fade it off a little bit more, all right? That's the basics, all right? But that's gonna seem a little bit too easy. But this is really, I would say, the important part of the lecture, which helps us as a trainer to go quick and to really add value to our clients, is with luring, there are really three main bench, um, there are three benchmarks initially that you want to pay attention to. 
is um, is one is um, how much you can fade from the lure without the dog needing to consciously move away from the lure to complete the behavior. So when we're luring, the first step is we're just seeing how much we can fade away from the lure, right? Without the dog having to move away from it. So I'll, I'll give you an example here. I'm gonna turn down the volume over here All the same on this concept. one. This is an old video I did for a different um, production came, came, you know, Houdini. So this dog right here, we're able to get it to go into a down um, initially by, by having to follow a lure. But you notice it's, um, it's, I have to keep, this dog never really has to move away from my hand here. It's just following the treat does not have to move away from it in order to get it, all right? So you're going to hit a point with the dog, which are the first benchmark with the client is just going to see. That's like a dog very, you know, very, very beginning stage over here. Then over here, I have Darcy. This is from an old 4.0 video. If I wanted um, to just be able to say, Darcy, down. Right. Good girl, this is what right? We, she does it. So that's what we want. We want the dog to just go down. I'm gonna play this video and show you um, the point, the first benchmark, right? That I would say is the first benchmark for any client. Is every time I do this with Darcy, is I'm gonna bend over less and less, but she still definitely, instead of me going all the way to the ground, she's still basically following the lure the whole way. Watch this. I wanted to be able to do that without bend in my hand to the ground, you'd have to work on fading, right? So fading is like what it says, it's doing it very slowly. So usually any type of do fading, you're gonna do your cue first, right? Like I'm gonna say, I would say down, then I would go all the way to the ground if she didn't know that, her girl. But then every time I would do it, I would slowly fade away that prompt. So I would say Darcy, down instead of going all the way to the ground, I might go six inches off the ground, right? Good girl. And then I may go eight inches off the ground, right? Then I would say, Darcy, down, and then go a foot off the ground. Usually with something like down, the hardest part is when the dog has to move away from the tree to complete the down, right about there. Okay. So this would be where you would say the second bench, the second benchmark of, of luring is. You want to make the clients aware of where they're going to have a hard time. So you see with Darcy and with that puppy, I had to go all the way to the ground, that little Yorkie in the first video. And then with Darcy over here, I'm going all the way to the ground. I'm able to fade pretty quick, quickly with her to probably about 18 inches um, or so. Um, off of the ground. But at this point right here, this represents the second benchmark that you're trying to get past with the clients. And if you have them pay attention to it, it makes it really easy if they know they're going to have a hard point right here. So right here, you're going to see as I am fading and I get to the point where now the dog is following it, but I'm not going down any further than this point over here. The dog actually has to move away from the lure right over here. Now, with the down, you make it kind of easy by stopping, making sure they sort of stop at that point. The dog thinks it's going into the down to get the food, but I stop at a point that's a very uncomfortable position for the dog where the dog um, is almost likely to kind of get tired and drop into the down over here. But right here, with a down at least, I stop and I just wait out the dog and keep repeating down. And if you slowly moved up to that point, generally with a little bit of a weight, the dogs will drop into the down. And then I move my hand down quickly to reward, to, to reward the dog. So watch what happens here with Darcy. And she's... She's going to make it look a little bit easier because she went through this before in the video. Let's watch. Eight inches off the ground, all right? Then I would say, Darcy, down, and then go a foot off the ground. 
usually with something like down, the hardest part is when the dog has to move away from the tree to complete the down, right about there. <laughs> Watch this, she's going to have to go, move away, down. This is hard for them. Good girl, all right? Yes, sir. That's usually like... So that right there is the second is the second benchmark area. Now, I'm using down because I would say that's actually one. If if you want if you learn the concept with the down, it's pretty easy to do with anything else, like with the sit and stuff like that. But you're gonna see similar with something like a heel, right? You're first actually concentrating on right when you're marking it, being able to get the dog into the position, get the dog into the position, and then you're using less and less of a lure until you sort of get to that point where the dog has to not complete the dog has to complete it without completely following your hand anymore you have to be aware that the you need to be aware that the clients need to be aware that's that's going to be a difficult spot and if you don't coach them about that and they're not they don't bring the dog right to that point where they know they're going to have some issues and they wait the dog out and they give the dog just a little bit of help that is a that is a point that some of the clients are going to have are going to have trouble with. Um, next um, considerations on the first considerations is after you get to the um, you get them over the hump of moving away from the of moving away from the lure. Then the next thing is you just want to get the dog so they don't need the lure at all. And it is not difficult once you get them past that breaking point. Once you get them past that breaking point, you can basically, it's, it becomes much easier like you did in the beginning. You fade less and less and less. For instance, with the down, now you're saying down and just going less and less and less until you're just standing straight up, for example, with the, with the down. And it becomes a lot easier. So what you are looking for is just, if we're talking about a down, is to just be able to say down. And as long as you space, it's important, say down first, no movements before you start the lure process, you will see that the dog has responded to just the word down. And you make sure you're rewarding that dog right away. Do not pause. Do not pause. That's for the next step in the checklist where we're doing interval rewards, where then we can we can start slowing down the amount of time that the dog gets a reward. But at this stage, it is really, really quick, all right? So those are the first considerations of the lure. Second consideration of the lure um, over here is once the dog responds to the cue without luring, then you have to pay attention to additional prompts. Please pay attention to this because this will bite you in the butt later if you're not consciously paying attention to it paying attention to it. So, so if I'm using the down as an example, we now have someone who's not using their lure, but they're saying down and they may be bobbing their head, all right? Pay attention that the clients or even ourselves are not bobbing our head or doing some other movement um, um, before anything that we're doing, make sure there's nothing else going on consistently besides just the cue that's coming from your mouth. That's a really common one because then we think the dog knows it and then we move on to phase two to, uh, to a higher level training and the dog is not responding or a different handler is handling the dog and the dog is not responding the same way to that handler as it was to the first handler. And you you're and you need to troubleshoot was that first handler doing additional prompts that were not related to the initial lure. Make sure you address that. The next thing, considerations, is body is not only um, head movements are and body postures in general are body positions. You will notice in early training, everyone is standing right in front of their dog training. The dog is right in front of them with their puppies and they're doing sits and they're doing downs. And, um, and the dog is used to seeing the person stand straight up, looking down at them and do it. Make sure even in phase one, before you move on, that you at least switch it up a little bit. All right. Have the owner 
be in different positions, all right? Call the dog while they're still in phase one, mix it up. When the dog is in a heel position uh, to the side of them, practice sits and downs when the dog is on that side, move the dog, lure the dog in different areas, switch, switch positions as much as possible, have them do this while they're sitting in a chair, watch the body positions. It's gonna give, the, it's gonna make things a lot easier moving, moving forward. Other thing, which I forgot to even put on my notes over here, but as I'm talking, I'm thinking of it. Be careful of pattern training, all right? Pattern training is not typically probably fall into the category of fading off the, fading off the lure. We might as well say it here is be careful when you have a client or even ourselves, if we always do things in a certain order, like we always have the dog sit first, then tell the dog down, then have the dog heal. Make sure everything gets mixed up because again, the dog stop paying attention to the cue and they start remembering what comes next. So when we're in phase one training, mix it up. In phase one training, it's pretty easily to get the, to be working on three or four or even five different commands um, all in the same session. But you're keeping track of where the dog where the dog is at. And it's it's all about this checklist over here, right? It's all about the checklist. I love the checklist. This allows you, don't, I suggest as a professional, don't do a, a package where you say, you know, okay, lesson one, we're working on the sit, and lesson two, we're working on the down, or we're just doing phase one, sit the first lesson, and phase two, sit the next lesson. Use a checklist system. It's good to give estimates to people, but it's it's very useful to be able to work work a checklist, know where every dog is at, which ones you've been working with, with the client, and then also know which ones that they have marked, an example on the down, which ones that they've been working off of, fading off of the lure. So then as the clients know things, you can exit off, all right? And we know exactly where they're at. It's great for your training records. It's good for them to be able to visualize. You get clients for longer periods of time when they can see exactly where they're at. Don't forget to keep training notes, keep a, a, keep a good training log, and it makes things um, much, much easier for the, for the, the clients, all right? Um, so, yes. Always work on this. Do not confuse this with environmental generalization, right? So even though we are working on when you're doing fading, um, fading the lure, um, fading off prompts, all prompts, do different positions, try different presentations. Um, it is generally falls into the you you once you start changing around positions and things like that, it does kind of fall into the category scientifically of generalization of the dog seeing like different presentations and doing it, but try to separate it in your notes um, from environmental generalization, all right? So not only do we want this dog to be fade off any prompts that are just coming from the handler, um, be careful not to confuse it with general generalization of having the dog also do it in as much different areas as possible, right? Not just in the kitchen or the living room, wherever wherever the, the handler is working with the dog, but like in the yard and stuff like that. And remember, phase one is all about making it easy for the dog, easy, easy for the client. Any environment that's too distracting, you you don't worry about it. You start handling it in phase two and possibly even even phase phase three. All right, now in phase two, this can be always keep good notes, keep notes of exactly what the dog has accomplished in phase one in regards to fading off of prompts and different positions and stuff like that. Um, I, I suggest don't go, I say in phase one, make it easy for the clients. Like have them just doing these things with the dog within six feet of them, um, making it really easy, but keep good notes because generalization and, and you know different positioning and stuff like that where continuing the fade off of any any prompts this can be continued in phase two all right just get to the point just do it to the point where it's easy and fun for the client 
anything too difficult can also be addressed in phase two because we're using uh, the leash at that point to help with uh, to help with the dog. Um, um, one last thing here is fading off of prompt when you do not use the lure. There are times, even in um, in obedience, where you did not use an actual lure that you have to fade off of. Sometimes you've just done, it's just been a presentation or a situation that was a prompt for a dog to do a behavior that you have been rewarding. So I'll give you an example. Um, I mentioned in the, in the stream about, about um, with marking, which some people for down, if they had really hard time luring the dog into the down, they may have just waited until the dog was tired after it exercised and they just can predict their dog always goes and lays down in a certain area of the house at a certain time of the day. And they were just marking when the dog went into a down in a certain area and they were just given, um, given a reward for it. Another situation would be something like the speak command where they know a dog barks easily in certain situations and they may start marking it and rewarding it or bringing things where the dog they're playing fetch with the dog and the dog is bringing objects to them. Um, so anything where you weren't necessarily luring the dog to do something, but you were getting the, you were able to get the dog to do, to do a behavior and you want to fade off of any sort of prompt that you were getting the dog to do it. It's very simple. It's just, it's basically just called differential reinforcement is once you can get a dog to do a behavior in the presence of different prompt in the presence of different situations, but you don't want the dog just doing it on its own all the time and expecting a reward is you only reward the dog when you did a cue first. So an example would be with the down, the dog comes in its house, it is tired, you know it's about to lay down, you start saying the word down, and then when the dog lies down on its own, you reward the dog, and that's the only time you reward the dog, right? Um, if you're teaching the dog to bring things to you, you're teaching the dog to bring things to you, and you were starting with something really easy, like it bringing its own toys to you. And then the dog is just picking up things and bringing things to you on its own. Um, you Same thing. In those situations where the dog is around its toys or it's around whatever you pick up, you're just given the cue first when you're in the situation, reward the dog. The dog does it on its own. They're just not getting rewarded for it. The concept is pretty easy. It's actually pretty easy to fade off of any environmental prompt once you can get the dog to do to do the behavior um, um i'm gonna do i'm gonna take see what questions i have over here in uh in, in the pack howl uh, but i'm gonna give a quick um you know recap of this um the 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 concept of fading fading off the prompt is very easy so what is fading off the prompt it is simply tr the training process that results in the dog responding to the final desired cue from the handler without any hand signals, without any prompts, without any help, all right? How do we get the dog to do that? Um, with the prerequisites is you just need to be able to get the dog to do the behavior, any sort of prompt possible, all right? Um, I would not address this with a client unless you can just see they can get the dog to do the behavior any way that they can, all right? Keep it simple. As long as they can mark the behavior, make sure they can mark it, that they can get it. Don't really mention or go into, it could be within the same lesson sometimes that they do it, but concentrate on the marking before we go into fading off of the prompt, fading fading from the lure. Um, there's a bunch of things to consider, right? Fading from the lure is, um, there's three breaking points. There's, there's, there's three main things to consider is go as far as you can while the dog is still basically following. Then you have to make sure you find that breaking point. There's usually a point with some commands where the dog has to move away from the lure. Then you continue to fade from that point on until there's no fading, no fading at all. Don't forget to 
acknowledge if there's any other prompts going on that does not have to do with the luring, not only with your with um, with body postures that we're doing, but also also positioning. All right, let's see what we got in the questions here. I see, I see Art says, any reason you can't have more than one command cue, um, verbal on and physical gesture, because as long as both are taught up through avoidance, both the physical and the verbal are cues. There are times when you might not want to make a sound. So you use the physical cue, but you gotta be careful that the physical cue is not really a prompt in my opinion. That's a great comment and question, Art. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. So the with some dogs, so there's, there's so many different directions we could go with this question, Art, is first, you can just simply, um, the simplest way of have a dog having more than one cue is having some dogs that are bilingual, right? I've had dogs that were bilingual, that with no commands in English and say German. So someone imports a dog and the dog was already trained in German and, they, and then you wanna teach the dog in English you and the dog never really forgets the German commands, just like humans, as long as both languages are being rewarded or being reinforced properly, a dog can be bilingual. And now you can you can also have separate forms. So in a, a classic example is verbal and also hand signals. So in my opinion, hand signals are one of the easiest things to, to teach a dog because the hand signals usually start off as lures in most of the case and, and a lot of times, but others don't necessarily, right? So I'll give you an example, like a sit, a lot of people are doing like, you know, an up thing with the sit, which is gonna look a lot like how we lure the dog with the treat and the come might be like this and we, you know they move their hand toward it towards themselves where often that is used the same movement someone's taking a leash right and helping the dog towards them so the lure the initial lure um is very easy to become the command so if someone is doing verbal is doing verbal and hand signals i generally suggest I found it easier if you if someone wants to do both is because the hand signals are so easy for the dog to to learn because it it's related to the lures is I have people work on luring off all the body language first then go back to the hand signals um, um, to make it to make it easier so you know the dog knows the the verbal and then go back to the hand signals and make sure the dog knows the hand signals but physical so. Um, I've done, I do this a lot. I used to do this a lot with my clients. Um, when you go into phase, phase two, and you learn how to do things like, um, escape conditioning with the dogs using, you know, gentle pumps, the, a lot of things you do with the leash, if it's gentle enough, it can be used as a cue for a dog to do a command. So I'll give you an example. Um, you can teach a dog sit verbal in phase one. Then when we go into phase two, we can use the leash to as even though it's it's initially taught really to teach the dog how to escape any sort of leash corrections, pressure up on the leash and with the right training collar, a little bit of pump, we can teach the dog this little pulsation. It's slightly annoying, right? But we teach the dog that this collar pulsating on the dog's neck, if they go into the set, it goes away, right? We use it as escape conditioning in the beginning, but then it can naturally also be used as another cue for the dog, where especially we do a phase two style, which is just learning. They're just learning the way something feels, even though it's mildly annoying, um, with a little bit of classical conditioning, it really becomes a positive thing for the dog too if it's given by itself. If you if you teach the dog, I'm gonna pump, move the leash up and pump it a little bit, and even early on in the training, even in phase one, if it's never gonna escalate to something that's technically very uncomfortable that they would want to avoid, you could put pressure up on the leash and then even guide the dog with the lure, you know, and, and give it the treat. 
And then eventually just the pressure up on the leash will be a sit command to the dog. So if you're in an area where you're being quiet or you have a deaf dog or something like that, and you can't give the dog hand signals because you're going to be busy, pressure up on the leash can mean sit, pressure up can mean down. And it does not have to be, it does not have to be um, um, anything very aversive, like, you know, mildly, mildly aversive or not even aversive at all. It's just something that they could, you know, that, that they, that they can feel. And with a little bit of common sense, right, you can see the versatility of that, where you can start that in phase one as the cue itself, or it can go into phase two. If you're using it in phase two, you just make sure, you know, with phase two, we're talking about command structure and when punishment comes and doing condition punishers and stuff like that. So I've had a lot of, lot of dogs, I have known lots of dogs that will do a hand signal, will do a verbal, and then do commands by by a feel. Um, good for police officers, anyone that might need to be quiet in situations or something like that, or really for anyone. And then of course, um, blind and deaf dogs too, doing the, doing the, doing the uh, leash, right? You take, you could take a blind and deaf dog, which I've, which I've worked with and put, teach it when they're on the leash that they just feel little sensations up, down, this or that. You can lure them and you can reward them the same way that you can do taps. You know, you can go in like when there's nothing on them and you could tap under their chest to get them to go into the sit or tap on their shoulder blades to get them to go down, tap and lure. It's just endless, all right? Um, it's, it's really endless, but of the combinations of things that you could do, but what is really important is it has to make sense on paper. You have to do things in a certain order try not to do things like at the same time, right? Like don't do Q and lure at the same time. Q, then lure. Because then you know when just the Q is getting the response that you actually want from the, the situation. Um, so, and like I said, it, it's the, the, the sky's the limit, all right? The sky's the limit. I always liked luring for obedience. It was my go-to way for the clients and for my ink kennel because I felt it was the quickest way. Like I was able to see exactly the moment the dog got it, but I would do, um, I would command lure. I saw, I would always lure right to the point where the least amount that I needed the dog to, you know, to, to do it. And then I would lure less and less and less. And usually within a session, for most basic commands with the dog, um, sit down, come, um, heal, sometimes a little, little bit trickier is you're fading off the lure. Even at your, you could sometimes mark it and fade off the lure for most commands, but you have to break it down you, know, you have to break it down. Um, let's see. Um, Arthur says regarding you do not use the lure section, aren't these examples of capturing a behavior and then putting it on a cue. Yes, yeah, sure. But the thing about, so yeah, you can capture, you can capture a behavior and put it on cue, but you need, um, it's very hard to just any behavior you're trying to say capture is generally it's easier if you could somehow prompt the dog to do it inside of the environment. So if an example is, which to me, it's considered a prompt. If, if you put the dog in a small enclosed environment where there's nothing, let's say we want to teach a dog to lay down on its placemat and you're not going to lure the dog or do anything. You're basically doing free shaping. If you have the dog in a small gated area and there's nothing but just a placemat, you're much more likely to capture it. But anything that helps the dog I consider a prompt, you know, so there's almost any time you're trying to capture behavior. If you think about it, there's almost always some sort of prompt, something in the environment that was, you know, that was helping to, to helping to trigger the behavior that you were trying to capture, whether it's like barking at the door, someone wants to train their dog to bark at the door, they're it's very helpful if you know or you have someone outside that's making a noise by the door or something, so you're prepared to really capture it. So um, there's usually some sort of prompt so you can 
capture the behavior. Yeah, but you can, a dog can randomly, if you're randomly waiting for a dog to do a behavior, it's very hard to get the uh, repetitions involved. But in my experience, when a trainer is referring to capturing a behavior, they're doing something to the environment to prompt the behavior that they are, that they are capturing. And then how do we fade away that prompt, right? How do we fade away that prompt is, um, is you got a differential reinforcement. You know, you're only going to reinforce it now when you give the c command. Um, let me see. Cindy says, so hand signals are okay. Should I fade off those? Hand signals are fine if that's what you want. Um, hand signals, totally okay. The issue, the, prob the problem, it's really not a problem. It's a consideration with hand signals is body language is a dog's first language. So... If your hand signals are pretty easy for the dog, but if you do not make an effort to fade off of the body language at some point, um, the dog is always going to be looking for those hand signals. So that's why with the average client, because relying just on hand signals is very difficult for for a pet dog, even if even even a a deaf dog who can't hear verbal. Um, most deaf dogs even benefit from a pager, a vibrator to get their attention. So the dog learns to, to look at you and then get, and then get the hand signal. So I always, I always suggest standard have clients work on the verbal, then do the hand signals is like an add on or like an extra thing or like a funding for the dog. Um, if not, if you conscience, if you do Hand signals first. It's not as useful as verbal for a healthy dog. That's not that's not deaf. Um, and when people are paying for your time, um, I like to do verbal because the verbal is going to become more more useful. Then I'll do. Then the hand signals are easy, right? It's easy to do the hand signals. But if we're doing a lot of hand signals, it's it's usually harder for the clients to get the dogs doing the verbal as like a side thing as, as a side effort but hand, hand hand signals are good and they're very they're very useful and you'll be surprised they're easy because the hand signals most of them are re relate to the original lure that you would give the dog but you got to make an effort put it on the record you really have to make a separate checklist you know and put it in your training notes to make sure the dog know whatever cues you want the dog to know you put it on there same thing with like a whistle like a dog a dog whistle or something if someone wants to do do uh, do a dog whistle, you separately in the log for the verbal come and for the dog whistle. And dog whistle is not just for the come, right? People do different things with the whistle for dogs to change direction, do different positions, all all kinds of stuff. Um, let's see. Kimberly says, "Yep, yeah, I still have to figure out to do with the prompt." And he says, "Thanks. We've done both and very clear signals." So don't confuse the AC. Yeah, the good thing is it's um, with with training dogs and fading off of fading off of lures. Really, the whole process. It's remember the base to all the training is sinopraxis. So you design the training program so it makes the owner's life easier and the dog's life easier, more enjoyable, and it contributes to to the bond. That really is is the base. So if you understand training, there's versatility, right? In these lessons, I give suggestions, but I like to break it down. If you break it down and you know the, you know, these things exist, you know, this, like this is common language um, for anyone, not just people training dogs, right? It's people doing stuff with humans, a, 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 ABA. These are, these are building blocks. This is, you really want to become, you know, a dog trainer trains dogs. Um, you really, I suggest shoot towards being more of like a dog training technologist, right? Meaning if you're a technologist, you understand how it works, right? There's a difference between a technician and a technologist. A technician can, can repeat, follow systems, things like that, get things done, get things built. Technologists can, can, design really so you can use the suggestions anyone listening to these streams you can pick and choose and substitute but have it make sense on paper right have it make sense on paper first like all right the blueprint makes sense 
makes sense. And then test it in real life. It makes sense on paper. Then it works in real life. It's easy. It gets you, it, it works for you. It works for the clients. Then, then go ahead. You can do, it gives you the versatility so you can work with, work with any dog. Um, my, the suggestions that I make are generally based off of if someone's working with a lot of dogs, doing group classes, I like to focus on common denominators of what works for the most dogs and for the most clients to be able to train the dog quickly and humanely um, is without being able to mess it up, right? Without being able to mess it up, the directions are pretty easy. That was always how I chose, how I was gonna train, how I was gonna train the dog. And the exact way that I would do it would change even year, year by, by year, constantly, constantly tweaking, which I'm sure a lot of you guys are too. So do I have any other questions? If I don't have any other questions about this stream, I think this is a pretty straightforward one. The concept is, re is really straightforward of, of, of luring. I just wanted to break it down, right? There's definitely some considerations here. We don't want to just fly through it. Think about the little considerations and then that'll help get some of the clients get over, get over the hump. So I will be back on Wednesday for more Q&A and I hope everyone enjoys their, their weekend.